everybody. Welcome back to the podcast, Steel Mace Nation in effect. My name is Fred Moore. Today's episode number seven, and we're uh, speaking with Dr. Tony Lamana, a.k.a. at Weightlifting Doc. Go on Instagram and check out what he's doing. He's doing some uh, heavy kettlebells and some heavy mace work, you know, 10 and 2s and 360s. He is a plethora of information, and I wanted to get him on the podcast because uh, essentially, you know, he gets down to the, the biomechanical levels of what we are doing when we're flowing or throwing around a steel mace and swinging it and everything and using kettlebells, what, whatever, how, how our bodies are being used, what's, what's being affected, how are we building muscle, how are we burning calories, so on and so forth. Uh, Dr. Tony Lamana is a U.S. National Kettlebell uh, gold medal winner of the 2018 IKLF uh, competition. He also won the silver in the same year. He's a strength athlete. He's a professor. He's a coach. He's a chiropractor, a nutritionist, and a self-proclaimed biomechanics nerd. Uh, The podcast is full of information so get out your notepad and jot some stuff down before we head over and check out the podcast that we did just want to thank everybody for tuning in and helping make this podcast the success so early on um, if you can please go to itunes go to youtube go to soundcloud uh, whatever it is that you're listening to this podcast on or watching it on and just uh, f- click follow and subscribe And, of course, if you could please leave a review if you like the podcast, that would be most appreciated by me. And you would help the podcast actually come up in the the ranks to get a little bit more recognized. And what this will help do is establish Steel Mace Nation as uh, a good place of information for you. I hope to be able to continue to bring on amazing guests that will help make the Steel Mace community tighter, stronger, healthier. Um, I'm always going to be asking coaches and, and business professionals about, you know, how to, how to coach uh, on the business side of things. Like, how, how can we introduce Steel Mace um, and other forms of training to a potential client? How can we get new clients? How can we uh, train our clients and uh, program uh, so that we could grow our business and, you know, do the right thing and, and give people what they want. So they're going to have all that. And plus, um, you know, just want to be able to talk about things that are fun and have a good time. So you guys make all that possible with your reviews and everything like that. And also, uh, the podcast is actually recorded at a shared universe podcast studio in Eatontown, New Jersey. It's a professional podcast studio and I do have to go out of pocket uh in order to do this podcast and on a weekly basis it can add up so a way another way to support would be to go to steelmacenation.com and you can check out the clothing the apparel that we have there we have uh t-shirts for ladies and men we've got a really cool snapback hat um actually I'm not wearing it right now but there's the snapback hat with the logo on it that's Mr. Mace Bones there for you. Uh, the prices are pretty good, and um, any little bit would help to support the podcast, and I appreciate it from the bottom of my heart if you do. So without further ado, let's move on to the podcast with Dr. Tony Lamana. Here we go. Dr. Tony, how you doing, man? I'm doing well. How about yourself? Very good, very good. Uh, so how's California treating you? Oh, I love it. Love the ocean. This is my, uh, my home away from home. So, Okay. Where, where else is your other home? So I live uh, full-time in Arizona. I live in Phoenix. Okay. Yeah. And I, in the summer, I mean, it's a great place, but in the summer, not, not as great. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I did a, a trip out to the Phoenix area about two years ago to go mountain biking. What a, what a great trip. Um, I did it early um, in the spring. Um. And it was like I, I had three days in between my shifts at work at the firehouse. Fly in, 
drive over, get a bike, and go hit. Like, everything is, like, right there. You could see all the mountain ranges. Yeah. And I just hit as much as I could, got back on the plane, flew home. I was at work the next day. But I got sunburned, like, pretty bad. Uh, oh, yeah. And it, was, it wasn't even hot at the time. Yeah. Yeah, right now, I don't know. Uh, I was talking to one of my athletes yesterday, and she's like, uh, yeah, it's going to be 114 tomorrow. Like, okay. Wow. <laughs> I'm glad I'm here. It's like 72 right now. So. Are, are the athletes training in that heat at all, or do they just go indoors? What's that? Do the athletes actually train in that heat for any reason, or do they just stay indoors? You know, uh, none of mine do. Yeah. <laughs> I don't. They're the smart <laughs> I, ones. I, 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 mean, I, I mean, yeah. I mean, I know some people that hike in it, which I think is kind of crazy, too. When it gets over 100, and I don't know. I just I don't have the capacity for that. So Yeah. Um, yeah. To be honest with you, we were training one time. It was like 90. We were training out in the field behind uh, the college. And I was like, okay, this is the last day of training outside. <laughs> That's <laughs> it's it. It's too hot. Yeah. 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 So I, um, I came across your Instagram, and um, I saw you swing at some heavy mace in, in your house, it looks like. Like yeah. <laughs> all the different rooms of your house I've seen. <laughs> your refrigerator, the air conditioner. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, so you're swinging heavy mace, and then the first thing I key in on is, well, obviously because you're a doctor and you you know you you read all the books and everything, but you're you're talking technical terms, which uh -huh. uh, I think are great because you're able to um, offer this information uh, out to the masses basically in a way that's understandable. And you're doing infographic charts and things like that, which I think are most helpful. I wanted I wanted to have you on the podcast uh, almost for that reason alone, because now we're starting to see more steel mace coaches appear right. out there. And, and, you know, look, there's kettlebell coaching going on, too, and you do all that stuff, too. You do kettlebells and um, – you know, I think it's good information to have, you know, as as a coach, you know, like what exactly is going on when you do a swing, whether it's a kettlebell swing or a 360. Um, so, I, you know, thank you for putting that information out there because yeah, I'm yeah. using it. Uh, I'm basically like memorizing things or or I'll just pull your infographics up and show them to a, a potential client. Like, hey, this is this is what's going to get worked when we use a mace. Right. So uh, that's awesome. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad you guys are enjoying the info, man. Yeah, it's, it's definitely helpful. Um, you know, what can, what can you say about? Uh, well, first of all, um, you know, you um, you're a strength athlete, a professor, a coach, a chiropractor and a nutritionist. And you have uh, certifications in IKLF, uh, Inter International Kettlebell Federation. Um, so you got a lot of cool stuff going on. When, when did all so, this? So just just a, just a quick correction there. So. Um, I don't have a certification through IKLF. Um, oh. I, I competed in their in their organization, and I've got won some uh, some medals in their nationals and uh, okay. world championships. All right. Yeah, yes, yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. Go, you got a gold. I just don't want someone going. Hey, he doesn't have. Yeah. He not have that one. I may mean, have some certifications, just not that particular one. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. you got the good stuff. You got the gold, and you got the silver. So that's the <laughs> good. Congratulations yeah. on that. I'm I, sure the I, competition I was it. tough, right? Oh yeah. I mean, it's it's. Uh, I'll tell you what, I've, I've competed uh, a little bit of Olympic lifting. I've competed in powerlifting. They're all tough, but, man, kettlebell kicks my butt the most. I think it's because you need more endurance. I'm not really naturally an endurance guy. Yeah. So the high repetitions, I mean, I, I, find, it, I find it pretty challenging. So maybe that's why I like it so much. It's, it's something new, and, you know, it's really pushing me. So Yeah, and so you uh, were using kettlebells first, and then you found the steel mace. Is that how – Transpire. Yeah, I mean, to, to be honest, uh, I probably have been in a small capacity using the steel mace for about eight years now. Maybe, se yeah, seven, eight years. It's kind of went on it, got into it, mm -hmm. uh, and they brought out some of the information. And um, what was it? There was a, a magazine out for a bit. Uh, I think they bought them. Uh, and then I, I, it's funny enough because I, I got my certification under Rick Brown actually last year. Yeah. Uh, and but I saw him in a magazine. Uh, I think it was called Mad Methods, maybe it was called. And, uh, you know, I saw him in a magazine. It was probably like six, seven years ago. And uh, I had no idea who he was, but I just saw him swinging this freaking giant maces. And I was like, ah, oh, that's kind of cool. All right. And so I've been doing it, but probably about the last two years is when I really started to do it a lot more. And uh, so, uh, so yeah, I started with kettlebells. Uh, I've been doing that for probably about eight years. 
uh, kettlebell sport only for about two years. So the last two years is when I got into the kettlebell sport and got into the, the mace training, which I think are really a nice complement for each other, to be honest. So Yeah, uh, now kettlebell know, sport uh, is a more of um, uh, not as uh, strict form, right? Is that the best way to describe it? Well, it, it, you know, I would say it's different. I wouldn't say not, not as strict because there's, there's so much technique to it. Yeah. Um, like I have a video. Um, I'm, not, I'm not as good at doing it as a lot of the uh, – uh, you know, world champions out there, but, um, but, uh, I'm pretty good at, at some of the technical aspects. I put a video out on some of the, the, the aspects of what you need to do for, you know, sport versus, uh, I think one of my, one of my videos was hard style. One of them was sport style. So to give you, a, uh, an example, um, a lot of the technique for sport is designed to, you're going to do a lot more reps. So you want to preserve your grip. You want to, I mean, there's, there's ways of like coming down. Like when you come down, I really can't, you can't see my arm here, but when you come down from the swing, instead of just coming straight over the top, you roll forward with the elbow and right. then it kind of comes like into this? the body. I mean, yeah, exactly. Right. And so there's a lot of little things like that that change. There's also more of an arc because you're using a little bit more momentum ah, because you're doing yes. so many more reps right. and trying to absorb more with your body. So for instance, when you go back into like a regular uh, swing or the hinge of a, of a snatch, like say hard style, you just hinge like you're doing a deadlift. It's mm -hmm. exactly the biomechanics of a deadlift. When you do it for sport, your knees actually, I wish I could show you my knees there, but your knees actually translate back and then they translate forward a little bit. Right. So I hope that's making sense. I mean, there's a lot, it, there's a lot to it, but yeah, I, but there are, there, there are some subtle differences, but it's all designed because you're going to be doing, you know, a 200 rep set probably, or something, maybe 150 reps, depending on the weight you're using. Yeah. So the, um, the sport style is, is more efficient. You're using momentum. You're going to allow like, uh, your body to swing. Like you mentioned your knees, your, your knees are going to move. Whereas the other style, the hard style, you're, you're really more or less, um, you're not going for any momentum. You're trying to pound the muscle, um, with a strict form where you're using 100% of your you, strength. You have, you have more body tension. So you're, you know, again, when you yeah. go back to that hinge, the knees, at least for me, when I do hard style, when you watch like, like Pavel or one of those guys, you know, that, that started the whole thing here in America, um, or I, Steve Cotter does both. Um, he's, he's good at, I mean, he's um, maybe Pavel is as well, but, but Steve Cotter is good at all, all kettlebell stuff, all things kettlebell. But basically, uh, yeah, you hinge back, knees don't move, and then you just drive forward with the hips. It's all, I mean, you use a lot of hip drive for, for both, of course. Yeah. But, yeah, it's all hip drive. It's, uh, I think it's more designed, of course, you do a lot of reps, too, sometimes with hard style, but I think it's more designed for heavier weight. Right. Uh, at least that's what I use it for. Um, you can use heavy weight with uh, sports style, but, again, you know, when I'm doing 106 kilograms, I'm getting a couple reps on each side. Yeah. yeah I know some people can get more. Um, there's, a, there's a guy named... Uh, I don't know if you know who Ivan Denisov is. He, he's an absolute, he's like a human gorilla. He's, he's a monster. And uh, he's like a, I think, I don't know, maybe 12 time world champion or something like that. And he did, he did uh, 50 kilograms, which is what? 110 pounds. He did that uh, 50 times, 20, I think like 25 each arm or something like wow. that. Wow. Snatch. Like wow. that's just, I mean, that's, if you, if you, I'm sure you kettlebell snap. Yeah. You, you see, it's yeah. Like, yeah. Yeah. I'm yeah. not doing that way. I'll tell you that much. Yeah. It's, it's freaking brutal, man. Yeah. So, yeah. I was so, like, I'm going to do, I'm going to do 10 each side. I was so inspired. I right. did like three, which, eh, you know. <laughs> <laughs> All right. You're not that far off from 10, yeah. I guess. Well, he, he also weighs probably about 240. I'm 180. So yeah. I'm like, All right. He's got me by the weight as well. And he, he he's, he's literally a freak of nature. So yeah, that's in a good, in a good way. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. There's people out there. They're the way they're built. Like you said, he's like a human gorilla. So I'm picturing almost like short legs but he's probably a tall guy though right you know he's probably yeah you know, i don't I, it's funny i tried to find out how tall he is i can't find his statistics anywhere except for like what a weight class he competes in but he's got to be about six two i'm yeah. guessing i mean the way he looks compared to other people i, I haven't met him but um I, i'm five seven i'm a short guy i'm five seven so they're all tall compared to me yeah, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah you some people are just built with such uh durability and resiliency and and it's like these movements are like part of their DNA. They don't, it's yeah. like they train, but it, like they're already like 
yeah. so far advanced physically. It's the funny thing about like the internet and Instagram. It's like, you know, you'll do something and people be like, wow, you just lifted whatever it was, you know, this many times or this much weight. Or, and then I'll go on and I'll look and see what one of these guys, uh, you know, like De- uh, Dennis Vasilev is another world champion. I'll see what they did. And I'm like, I just did that with half the weight. <laughs> right. <laughs> and I almost died. Yeah. You know, so yeah, it's, it's pretty impressive stuff out there. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. I mean, Instagram and well, social media in general. I mean, you get, you see a lot of, the, a lot of stuff going on. It's inspiring though, you know? Um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. You, it, 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 you know, you, you get focused on what you want to do. You see people doing amazing things and you're like, well, I'm just going to, I'm going to do what I do, you know? And so, um, and, and with the steel mace, you know, uh, seeing, seeing, uh, the weight that you're doing and, and, um, I was inspired to get more into 10 and twos after your post, uh, about how you're hitting the tricep. Mm-hmm. I, I, this is, this is valuable information, you know, because there's, um, the dogma, I guess you, if you will, of, you know, there's people out there doing traditional strength training and that, that's where I come from. Um, and I would never think doing a 10 and two would have as much effect on developing a tricep muscle right. as say doing reverse grip, uh, uh, bench press or doing dips or, or any of those things. But it turns right. out, uh, with that one post that uh, you, you, you proved that wrong. And in fact, yeah. didn't you didn't you say it, it complemented your kettlebell game? Yeah, absolutely. So so an interesting point about that is, you know, because I came from you know bodybuilding. Uh, you know, when I was a kid, wanted to be like Arnold. You know, the yeah. whole thing. And you know, that was my inspiration as a kid. And so I did bodybuilding for years. And eventually, you know, it, it, it was a long time. And I, I eventually started to get bored with the same routines. You know, chest day, back day. You know, or back and buys. You know, things like that. Chest and tries. And so that's when I started looking into, you know, uh, unconventional type movements and, you know, more fun. I want to say, I'm not that the bodybuilding is not functional, but yeah, you know, other movements like, you know, maces and kettlebells and just things like, you know, even more body weight stuff. And so, um, but what happened, you know, from doing bodybuilding and I'll be honest with you, you know, when I was doing bodybuilding, some of my technique was good and some of it just flat out sucked. Yeah. So, you know, cause I never really had a coach as a kid. And so I just grew up doing what I did, you know, doing, doing, um, uh, you know, bench press with the T arms, yep. and, you know, which is really terrible for your, your shoulder. Yep. Um, I mean, I've even read articles, bodybuilders saying, yeah, put your arms like that. It's better for your delts. And it's like, yeah, but it's bad for your joints. You know? <laughs> right. And so, um, so I had really, uh, for, for a long time, for a couple of years, or for at least a few years, I had some really bad uh, issues with my elbows. And uh, I also did a lot of martial arts. I did no gi jiu-jitsu for a couple of years. I did, uh, you know, kung fu for many, many mm-hmm. years. And uh, it really was the, the jiu-jitsu and the, and the poor weightlifting, like, um, uh, yeah, basically just poor technique with uh, lifting heavy weight that messed up my elbows. So I couldn't get full extension, you know, on my elbows. Uh-huh. And I had a lot, a lot of pain in my elbows. I mean, I, I couldn't do skull crushers, couldn't do any of those movements. Right. So I was very limited in what I could do even for triceps. This is why I'm bringing this up, the whole thing about triceps. And really, you know, the, the, the tendon that goes into the elbow, you know, from the upper arm, that's, that's your triceps. And so, um, yeah, when I started getting into the kettlebell, you know, even, even my lockout for the kettlebell was kind of weak, you know, it was like, it was shaky. It was, it just, my elbow didn't lock all the way. Like it lock, it stopped, but it didn't, it wasn't in like full extension. So I started doing the, when I started and I really, I'm saying about a year ago, I really started to push the heavy mace stuff. And, um, you know, my triceps were always trash. So what the hell is going on? Yeah, right. That's what made me start to think of it. Like, what, what, what are we doing here? Like, well, I started to break down the movements to see why are the triceps. And, and, and I, initially, it presented because I, you know, I might have pushed a little too hard. It, it presented as, man, my elbows are hurting every time I do these ten to twos. And then all of a sudden, you know, I started to kind of adapt to that. And then the triceps, you know, I would go heavier, and the triceps would get sore. And so, come full circle to today, like very current recently. You know, I'm doing, you know, I'm training these, this kettlebell sports stuff and my lockout is strong. My elbows don't hurt. Um, I'm doing heavy 10 to twos. Now, sometimes when I hit, when I do the 50 pound mace, my triceps hurt. If I do a lot of reps, my triceps hurt the next day for sure. Yeah. But, uh, but a good soreness, you know what I mean? Not like a, my, oh damn, my joints are about to friggin' explode. Right. You know, like, like, uh, the guy who makes ADEX, uh, maces, Don, he's like, Hey, ice those elbows, man. I was like they're good. Like, I mean, it's, you adapt to it 
And uh, so co- come full circle, my, my, my elbows are re- rehabilitated. My tendons are stronger. Um, and yeah, like you said, man, the, the te- especially the 10 to 2s. I mean, the, the 360 will do it as well. But the 10 to 2s especially because of the stop and go, man, it'll really blast the triceps. And so I'm able to get – I've got more tricep development than I've had in years. Uh, my dips are better. My, my lockout for my jerks, uh, you know, all that stuff. So – yeah, yeah. So I'm, I'm a teacher. I, I go, I go like, and people make fun of me because I go on like 14 tangents and then eventually come back to full circle. <laughs> well, it's part of your so, process, right? Yeah. So some people hate it. Some people like it. I, I, I apologize if that if that's distracting. Hey, look, you know what? Any way you can get the information out there, we don't care. Yeah. You know, if you go yeah. off on on all these tangents, that's fine. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it is it is amazing what you're talking about um, because. I think, um, you know, with me, the, the mace was, you know, something I took to because it was helping me with my upper back mobility. Um, I didn't even think about my elbows. I didn't even think about my triceps. But um, then, you know, your post got me thinking. So I started doing heavier 10 and 2s recently. And, and um, you know, I'm feeling exactly what you're talking about. Yeah. So I'm psyched well, because well, and that's the thing. The thing that people don't understand. I mean, don't get me wrong. You're going to work the triceps with lighter weight and higher reps. Yeah. But you're not going to feel it the same like the next day. And as far as like hypertrophy, hypertrophy is based on heavier weight. That's just a fact. I mean, you got to load the muscle and uh, people say, oh, 50 pounds, you know, like you get these big power lifters, 50 pounds. Like Chris Duffin makes the, the shoulder rock. Like the dude's a monster. Like he's a power lifter and he's using this stuff. So, and he's not doing hundreds of pounds on it. He's right. doing whatever he does, 20, 30, 40, 50 pounds, maybe. I don't know. But, uh, you, you know, again, when you look at the physics, like I've did a few physics posts. Um, when you look at the physics of, of a levered implement, 50 pounds is astronomically heavier than if we were lifting like a dumbbell or like put 50 pounds on a barbell or something like that. So, um, do you actually have like a roundabout number of what that would come out to 50 should've, pounds should've on it up for you. I, you know, I, I have, uh, it depends. It depends on what we're talking about. The length of the handle. Yeah. It depends on the length. So I have a, I have a number of posts. It also depends on the forces we're talking about. Cause I've done posts on torque Yeah. and you can do torque with like a press movement. So I've done a post on that. And I think that I just sent that to somebody, I think it was like 1.7 times or one point, either 1.4 or 1.7 times the amount, depending on the length of the, the mace, right. uh, of a normal weight, but that doesn't take into account the torque. So it's so linearly it's, 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 you know, it's, it's one and a half, about one and a half times the weight, but, uh, that torque that pulls, you have to actually use stabilizers and work even harder. Um, uh, also when you're doing, uh, like a press, let's say with a mace with two hands, you're really pressing with one hand. One hand is, is to keep it from tilting, right. right? To keep it from the torque pulling the mace over. So the inside hand is actually, you know, if the, if the head's over this way, the inside hand is actually doing all the work. So it's really a one arm press with the mace as well. So a 50 pound mace is like pressing a 50 pound dumbbell times one and a half plus torque. So you've got so many factors. Wow. You know, another thing when you're talking about steel mace is um, the, you know, if you're doing like say 360s. So like this is to say I do with a kettlebell. So if I do 360 with a 20 pound mace versus a 20 pound kettlebell, well, the kettlebell is like right close to my head. Right. You know, that, that's great for mobility. <clears throat> that's going to do, I mean, I'm not going to say it's going to do zero for your muscle, but you got to do a lot of reps for that to, to really work the muscle. You do a 20 pound mace a hundred times for a 360, you're going to, you're going to feel it or you should feel it. You know, it's definitely going to tire you out a lot more because again, it's that levered implement. So we're talking about centripetal force at that point. Right? right. And so the longer, which is the force that, that you know, when you when you, you move in a circular movement, it's the force you need to generate to keep it from flying off out of that circle. OK. okay? Yeah. To keep it simple. And so um, so uh, the longer the lever. Right. So the longer it's called a moment arm, which is basically the radius. It's the, it's the lever itself. It's the, it's the length of the mace or the or the implement. The longer that moment arm. Right. The the, the more the heavier it is. And so or at least the, the more, more centripetal force it generates. And so, or you have to generate to keep it from flying out. Uh, another thing is, let's say we're doing a 10 to two, right? So we're, we're going around and we're stopping at the, the, the 10 and two position. I just did that reverse, the 10 to two position. Uh, and so uh, when we stop at those positions, that's where I usually calculate torque. Just torque all the way through the movement. <clears throat> but sometimes the torque goes to zero. When you hit down at the bottom, it's at zero. Right. But, 
I, I calculate, even though it's not the highest, I calculate the 10 and the 2 because that's where you stop. So that's where you stop. That's where the torque is going to pull. You're going to have to stop it for a second, right? You're going to have to stop the momentum and then move in the other direction. Yeah. And so, uh, again, when you look at that, let's see, I think I did, I did some calculations for, uh, for Rick Brown yesterday. Let's see if I can remember the numbers I wrote down. Um, it was, uh, I think it was like a, well, I, was, I think I was making a comparison between uh, a lever that's like a normal 8X, which is 51 inches when you load it to 30 pounds. And then uh, he's having a special one made, which is six inches longer. And so uh, I did the calculations between the two. And it was like 11 and change percentage uh, increase in centripetal force, 11 and change percentage increase in torque, and a 25% increase in angular momentum. That sounds like a bunch of gibberish. But the point being with that, I calculated that, that Rick says he does between five and 600 reps in a typical workout, let's say, of a 360. Okay. So 11%, you're like, ah, you know, it's okay. It, that actually generates for him, I think it was like, don't quote me an exact number. I wrote it down in my post, but it's like 4,500 pounds more work in that one workout. Ah. That's a, that's a lot of extra weight lifted. Yeah. You're talking about right. a 30 pounder, right? So, I mean, he might be using 50. The guy's, Rick Brown's a beast when it comes to the mace. Yeah. And so, you know, uh, when you're talking about a 30 pound implement, and just changing the length by six inches, you just did forty five hundred extra pounds of work, you know. In the uh, same, in the same, you know, to, yeah. Workout. Yeah, yeah. So by the way, not for, for the nerds out there, they're going to be like, "Hey, work in a circle is, is zero. What I mean is, you know, extra extra pounds lifted is what I mean when I say work. Just just so we know. Yeah. But yeah, so forty five extra extra forty five hundred extra pounds lifted. You know, a lot of times when I do kettlebell, I target like, okay, I want to lift ten thousand pounds. And so I'll pick a weight and I have to do, you know, let's say 200 reps with that weight to come close to 10,000 pounds. And so um, I don't always target my workouts like that, but just, it's, just, it's just the way sometimes I process. Like, okay, I feel like that's a good amount of work that I did in that particular set or workout. So hopefully that makes sense. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, to, so to break it down, I mean, you know, for anybody that doesn't really care about those particular details you threw out there is – if you just make these alterations in the handle length, a little bit of change in the weight or whatever, yeah. you're going yeah, that, to add, that's you're, you're going to add a total amount of extra um, weight uh, moved at the end of your workout, which translates Absolutely. over to a, a better, um, more progressive workout. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, I mean, there's, there's a number of factors that transfer to that, right? So one thing alone, just increase the length of the mace. Right. You, do more, you do more work, right? You're, you're, you're lifting more weight, basically, because of the forces involved. Um, if you wanted to, you could use lighter weight and do higher repetitions to get the same amount of work in. So let's say you didn't want to load, you know, because, again, yeah. if you're doing heavy, we, we know this from, like, you, you probably have done some, you know, powerlifting. I don't know if, you, if it was just bodybuilding. or but I'm sure you've done bench press, deadlift, yep. squat, which is yep. powerlifting. And so, you know, uh, we know that if you're always loading heavy weight, you're going to wear the joints down. Right. You know, you're going to wear them out. And it's funny because, you know, I, I have a, a, an aunt and uncle that live uh, near me in, in, um, in Arizona. You know, and they always support my stuff, but they're like, yeah, oh, the heavyweight's going to, it's going to wear, it's not going to wear on me because I'm going to use proper programming. And the thing is, you have to understand, you can't always do heavyweight, yeah. you know? And sometimes, you know, um, as ego-based beings, we're like, oh, I want to lift heavier, more, bigger, better, yeah, you know? Definitely. And, uh, and I, and I get there too. And then my body's like, Hey, you're not 22. Mm -hmm. And it reminds me, and then I have to scale back and, yeah. you know, so again, even with the mace, you're not going to always be lifting the, the 35, 30s, 40s, 50 pounders. Sometimes you're going to lift it, you know, the, the 15s, 20s, whatever, whatever it is that's, you know, a lighter weight for you. Again, I don't want to give specific numbers because, yeah. hey, when you start out, when I started out, 20 pounds was super heavy. And I was a power lifter. I, I mean, I was deadlifting, you know, 465 pounds. And, yeah. you know, I'm lifting a 20 pound mason. Like, what, why is it so freaking heavy? You know? And so, and a part of that's technique. You get your technique down, yeah. it becomes a lot better. And some of it's conditioning. And then thirdly, in addition to the conditioning of the muscle, is the strengthening of the tendons. And this is something, you know, I want to encourage. Like, if people are going to start the mace, because <clears throat> you can get discouraged real quickly. If you, if, you, if, you, if you shoot out of a cannon and you start out too fast, the tendons don't 
don't strengthen. This is the same thing. This is why bodybuilders, you know, bodybuilders that use a lot of anabolics, they, right. you know, they have a lot of tendon tears. Yeah. And the reason for it is because the muscle grows faster than the tendon. Right. And so it's the same thing when, it, when, you, when you're talking naturally, adaptation. The tendons are not going to get as strong or, or get strong as fast as the muscle. And so you want to start off, you know, with lighter weights and, and kind of slow it down. You know, don't start off doing a thousand reps. Right. You know, I, I have shirts from, this is from uh, Kettlebell Gains. I, have, I love their shirts. Great what guys. Is, what yeah. is that, clubs? These are, yeah, these are, these okay. are clubs. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, cool, cool shirt. And so um, I have one that says a thousand reps. Yeah. You know, and I wear it all the time when I'm doing swings. I don't always do a thousand reps, you know. <clears throat> I've done it before. I'm sure Mace Man comes close to that every day, or it's not every day. But, yeah. Um, you know, again, it, it, that's not, you don't want to start out doing that. You know, it's almost like that weekend warrior syndrome. You yeah. Know, people want to, oh, I want to do that. Yeah. Start, you know, learn a technique first, get, yeah. get, get the reps in. And by the way, uh, a piece of advice that uh, Rick Brown gave me that, that I give to people as well. Um, so I stole it from him and uh, is, is, you know, the best teacher is repetition, you know, just do the reps. Yeah. You practice. Know? I mean, practice, obviously, practice. You, yeah, practice, you know, and, and here's the thing too, and this is this is kind of a thing that I come from is, I always I've always told my athletes this because I taught, I've coached Olympic weightlifting, I've coached uh, powerlifting, I've coached kettlebells, <clears throat> and I teach I teach them all, and you know, and I coached in CrossFit settings. Uh, I didn't coach CrossFit, but I coached those things in CrossFit gyms, and uh, and now I currently have a, a class that I that I teach at the college where I coach all this functional fitness stuff, and I tell them. It's not practice makes perfect. It's perfect practice makes perfect. Yeah, yeah. So I'd rather you do 10 good reps than 100 shitty ones, right? Because yeah. 100 shitty ones get you really good at doing it shitty. Yep. You know, and uh, 10 good reps are going to work towards getting you good at doing it right, you know? Right. And now, now we know there's no perfect rep, but again, we're going to strive for that, right? We're going to work on My whole point of that is like work on technique. And so I'm really kind of a technique junkie when it comes to that. Um, my technique is not perfect in everything. So when you watch some of my videos, I do my best. <laughs> yeah. But, right. but I'm always striving, you know, to, to get the technical aspects of it because number one, it's injury prevention. Number two, it increases efficiency. There's a reason for technique. Yeah. Right. And the reason is it makes you better at that particular thing. So. I have a question for you about, um, about me personally. Uh, cause we're talking about like tendon issues and stuff. And, um, I'll tell you what I think it is. And you just give me your opinion. Obviously, sure. you know, we're, doing a FaceTime. This isn't like an official doctor's exam or something like that. But uh, Disclaimer, I, check with your doctor first. <laughs> yes. Check with your doctor first. It could be, it could be Tony, but you got to call him and make an appointment. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> okay. Yeah. So uh, I'm right-handed and um, I'm doing one arm, three sixties, right? Right hand, right arm. Perfect. First thing I start noticing on my left arm is right here on the tricep, if you can see it on the camera, on the outside, like almost on that skinny piece that's coming down where the tendon is, it starts getting sore. And it happens when I'm right here and I pull it over, right right here. So I'm trying to figure out what am I doing differently on the left than the right. And the only thing I can think of is that my left arm is a little weaker because I'm right-handed. And I'm doing like a death grip on the handle because I'm trying yeah. to really make sure. And because I notice I'm, on my right hand, I'm almost holding it with, with, with the OK sign. Like these fingers yeah. are almost like loose and I'm just flicking it. So when I go around this way, I got a, a, a firmer grip. And yeah. I, just, just your opinion, do you think that's what the issue is? Yeah, I think, uh, OK, so uh, here's what I would say. I think it has a lot to do with your, your right hand dominant, correct? You're right handed? Yeah. Yeah. I think it has a lot to do with that. So, like, biomechanically, this is what's in my head. You know, again, I, I can't say this is 100% it because I'd have to watch your technique. Right. Uh, I probably, if I watch your technique, I'm, I'm pretty sure I'd be able to give you a little bit more detail about it. But what I would say is um, so I'm going to back up and then I'm going to get into answering your question. So, when you're doing, I noticed this at least. Uh, when you're doing, I did some really heavy single hand and pretty high rep uh, ten, uh, 10 to 2s the other, the other day, and it made me start thinking. I'm like, okay, well, here's, here's why. I, I wake up the next day, and basically what you're talking about, that's the, la that's the lateral head of the triceps yeah. where you're pointing. Right. It was uh, – the, the long head's always sore because you work it. It, it, it does both movements, adduction and extension. 
And um, so that's always going to be a little sore. The, the lateral head was super sore. And I'm like, what the hell? Why is that different? Right. So I started brainstorming, like, why doing the single was it different? Now, when you're doing heavy, very heavy mace, like with two hands, and especially, in my opinion, especially the single, okay, you're going to um, – here, let me, let me see if I can show you this. You're going to internally rotate the shoulder more when you come over. It's a stability thing. Yeah. It's not a stability of the shoulder thing. It's, it's, it's a way to stabilize the actual mace because you're rolling your shoulder in to use your body more. Okay? All right. So, now why does that even matter? Well, let me explain. When I do this, so watch this. When I do this, the long head, which is the most active of the three for these type of movements, becomes less active. So, what takes over? What takes over is the lateral head. Okay? And so, um, and, and it's because of that internal rotation. So when we, into, like, so let, let's see, when you do a tricep, uh, oops, what did I just do there? Hang on. Okay. When I do, when you do a tricep, like a push down, right. have you ever done this with bodybuilding where you roll the hands, the knuckles in? Let me just, yes. I can't get my knuckles there. Okay. Yes. And so, and you hit exactly the, pot, the spot you're talking about, <laughs> that lateral head. Yes, right? you're right. Well, that's internal rotation of the shoulder. What you're doing is you're putting your body in a position to isolate that head more. Okay. All that to say, when you're doing a single hand 10 to 2, you isolate the, the, the lateral head more. So why is it hurting more on the left and the right? My explanation for you would be your right is significantly stronger, so you're, you don't have to internally rotate as much on that side, most likely. And the muscle's more adaptive because it's stronger. It's got you know stronger muscle fibers because it's, just, it's a, probably a larger muscle on that side if you were to measure it. Yeah. And so the left side has to, number one, it's not as conditioned or as strong. And number two, there's probably a little more, even if you can't see it, if you video it real close, maybe you'll be able to see a little more internal rotation on that side. So again, now you're hitting that lateral head even more. So in my opinion, it's not a bad thing unless you're getting pain in the actual joint. So if it's a muscle soreness thing, I think it's just time for adaptation. I, I think it's more of, it's not the joint. It, I think it's almost where it, the muscle starts to turn into tendon. So it starts to pull a little bit, yeah. Yeah, and it's because I could, I could just put, like, a finger on that spot, and it's just this fingerprint, minute section where I can feel sharp kind of – well, not sharp, but it's tender as can be. Yeah, yeah, so it's, so it's a little bit of inflammation in a tendon. Yeah, which, yeah. you know, I mean, like, um, you know, I, you get that every once in a while, obviously, but um, trying to work through it, I uh, I just backed off doing 360s with that arm, and I've been using like a a, a lighter mace. And the other thing too is um, I'm a uh, I went through Leo Savage's steel mace certification, and uh -huh. in the yeah. in the beginning of that, he explains you do this with your hands like karate chops. You're bringing your elbow across your nose. Yeah. So uh, I started focusing on doing that more, bringing it across, yeah. and that may be, correct me if I'm wrong, what you're talking about. That's correcting that internal rotation. Yeah, see, if, if that, that, that's exactly right. If, if, I, if I come across with the elbow, this actually, if you were to look at the actual joint of the shoulder, it's going to create some external rotation. Y yes, so, right. And I like that. You know, I, I had a, a, a short uh, conversation with, with Leo about this because I, I, <laughs> I did a post and I think we just had a, I think we were just saying some things differently, but I did a post uh, talking about, it was actually a two hand, uh, it was a, a tutorial on the 360. And I said, you don't pull to the opposite hip. And, uh, and I still, I, I stand by that as far as the technique that I do. Um, but there's two things to that. You can aim your elbow towards the opposite hip. I just don't bring it the hand all the way to the opposite hip on the 360. That's kind of what I was saying or trying to say in, in my tutorial. You know, when you when you do it uh, 10 to 2, you pull the hand and it basically taps the hip or touches the hip or comes really close to the hip. When you do a 360, it comes to the center. It's okay if the elbow is pulling that direction, but then you stop, you know, at vertical, right? But right. I really, really like what he was talking about with the coming across because he, he actually was, he sent me a little video on this. He was talking about it. He, he was coming across for the, for the single hand. I like that a lot because it does correct that internal rotation. Um, and it, it, I, I tried it. It actually is more stable, you know, with the, with the single hand. Yeah. Uh, but again, I still don't pull that hand. All, and I don't think he does either. Uh, I don't pull the hand all the way down to the hip. 
I pull the elbow across until the hand comes to the center. And so, again, I don't want to speak for his technique. I'm just saying that's how I do it. Yeah. Uh, but I agree with you. I think that pulling that elbow across is a, is a great technique, um, a great way to do it. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad. And, I'm, and, I, and I, was, I was going to tell you the same thing. Just, just go a little bit lighter. Right. You know, get uh, let the, the inflammation, that tendon, you know, ease up, you know, ice it a little bit. Um, I know there's a, there's a big, like, I don't think they're out there anymore too much, but there's like a big anti-ice movement for a while. Talking yeah, about what was that is, all about? You know, here's the thing. There's there's something called, I don't even, you can't really find this term anymore. I learned this way back in school. There's something they call, they probably call it something different now. It's called reflex vasodilation. And so what happens is, if you leave ice on too long, when you put ice on, the reason why it decreases inflammation is because it, it causes vasoconstriction of the ten, of the uh, blood vessels, which makes them smaller, basically. Right. Okay? And so, um, so it takes the swelling down. So less, less blood is leaking into the, the, what's called the interstitial space, which is the, the space between the cells. And so it decreases the swelling. And swelling is what causes the majority of the pain in, in any kind of injury like that or any kind of uh, inflammation. And so um, what happens after about 20 minutes is uh, your body thinks it's freezing. And so it has this sort of, it's not technically a reflex, but it's like a reflex where it opens the blood vessel back up. And so now what you've done is you've made the blood vessel bigger and you're yeah. putting more blood in the area, more blood's leaking into the interstitial space and the swelling gets worse, right. which means the pain gets worse. So I always tell people, I usually tell them 15 minutes, I say 20 or less, but, but I usually tell them 15 because people are not good with timing sometimes, at least patients. <laughs> and so, you know, 15 minutes of icing is good. You know, the whole, the whole theory was, oh, you're going to make it worse by icing. It's going to cause more damage. Well, not if you understand physiology. Uh, if you leave it on too long, it could increase the damage. Right. You know, and then they say, okay, it, it, there was another thing out there saying, okay, this, is, this inflammation, uh, you know, it's, it's necessary for healing. This is correct, by the mm -hmm. way. Mm -hmm. So, I, I mean, my full-time job is teaching anatomy and physiology right now. And so, um, so I teach every semester. We talk about inflammation and the process or actually stages of healing. Inflammation is the first stage of healing. Here's what I will say, and this will make it very simple, all right? If ice was, was that effective at stopping inflammation, there would be no such thing as Advil. There'd be no such thing as Aleve, right? You wouldn't need that medication because you just slap ice on it and the inflammation would go away. Right. So what ice does, it doesn't stop inflammation. It controls inflammation. And again, uh, using it wisely, like not keeping it on too long, you know, it's effective. So, you know, I think the anti-ice movement, they had some... Sometimes a little knowledge is, is dangerous. Yeah, you know, that happens some a lot. Accurate things like, oh, it could be a problem if you stop inflammation. True. Could be a problem if you have it on, you know, if you have this extreme vasodilation. That's true as well. But again, if you use it properly, uh, yeah, you'll be fine. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm, I'm, a, I'm a big ice proponent. I think I think it's very helpful, you know, and, um, you know, again, you know, if, if it's inflamed, just just go lighter. Rest. I, you know, rest for me. I mean, I, I do have people. People make fun of me because I post these videos and they're like, do you have a rest? I do have, I do have program rest days. Um, and, uh, the thing is, you know, sometimes you have active rest days. Like I have complete rest days, but then you have active rest days. And so then I'll pick up a, a light mace and I'll swing it a bunch. You know what I mean? Get, get some, do it more for mobility, right. you know, than loading the muscle and hitting that triceps, things like that, you know? So, and, so, uh, Hopefully that helps a little bit. Yeah, it definitely. Yeah, that definitely helps. And you, you know, you mentioned like total rest days, active rest days. Um, you know, I love active rest days because it's just like an easier day, but you know, you're still doing stuff. So you get those right. good feelings, right? You feel yeah. like you're actually using your body. I feel like when I wake up and I feel totally destroyed and I'm like, oh, I just need a complete day off. I feel like I went too far. Am I right, or is, am I? Am I? Is that necessary to push the envelope? Well, it it depends. Um, that's that's a tough question because it depends yeah. on the person. Right. Um, for people like you and I, I think it's normal because mm -hmm. we're going to push ourselves to the limit at some at some points. You know what I mean? And uh, especially like I say, if you're if you're thinking of competing in something, you're going to be pushing some of those days. So you're going to have some of those days we wake up, but. It's also your body speaking to you, right? Yeah. So those are the days I'll either have a, like a super light. Uh, actually, I prefer to have an active, like a very light active rest day on those days because it just gets the blood circulating, clears out a little bit of the lactic acid or whatever yeah. built up. And, uh, you know, so those are the days I like to have the, the more active rest. Um, I like to take a full rest day. Like when my body's just fatigued, that's when I take a full. I mean, 
I try and do at least one day a week where I take a full rest day and then one day a week where I do an active rest day. That's, that's probably okay. the average. Yeah. If I have weeks where I'm trashed, I'll take two full days off. You yeah. know, if I have weeks where I'm feeling better, sometimes I'll just do the one rest day and the active rest day is kind of like, like a me, a medium workout. So you got to really, you got to be sensitive to your body. You know, this is one of the things I'm trying to teach uh, some of my athletes is cause they're always, well, what do I do today. And I don't have a problem telling them what to do, but I'm like, you have to start feeling it. Like if you're, if, if you're feeling trashed, the weight that I program for you, that's gotta be lowered. If you're feeling great, bump it up. You right. know what I mean? Like that's, that's something I learned at Olympic weightlifting. Like not every day is a good day. Right. You know, like yesterday I lifted this weight and then two days later, I, I'm not lifting that weight. Right. What, what happened? Yeah. So, you know, and, and to be honest with you, you probably know this as well. You know, there's, there's days when I'm sore and, you know, I, I, I'm scheduled to do, you know, do a workout and I'll do the workout and I'm like, Ugh. I felt, I felt weak, Yeah. you know, and then, and then I'll do the exact same thing on a day when I'm not sore and I'm like, damn, I feel strong, you know? Yeah. So, um, yeah, I think you just have to listen to your body when it comes to that. Um, but I think you have to have program rest days because people, uh, people, I'm going to say like us, I don't know you real well, but I mean, I'm gonna, you know, you're obviously, uh, you know, ingrained in the fitness community and, uh, people like us, you know, we have to create our own regulator because we just keep pushing. Be right? more so intuitive. If, if yeah. So if you don't program it, like I read something, I'm not going to say the, the website because I don't care for it. And I don't want to say anything bad about anything, but there's a website and they have all, you know, some good information, and a lot of terrible information. And one of the, the, the memes that came off that website was never program rest days. Life will program it for you. I think that's absurd, but you know, it's kind of a meathead mentality. Um, I don't judge if that's the approach you take. All I'm saying is I think you have to program rest days because I've gone where I'll go days and days in a row until my body goes, okay, time to rest. Or I'll tweak something or I'll yeah. inflame a tendon or, you know, and, and then, my, then my workouts suck for the next week or two. And so, um, yeah, the smartest thing you could do is program rest days. And I'll, I'll tell you something else and not to, not to keep throwing information at you here, but something else that I think is so, is so vital, you know, and I, 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 I <laughs> I have one athlete. She's quite the phenom, but, uh, she, the, the one thing with her and any other athlete really that I try and ingrain is training is training. Right. And so let me explain what I mean by this. Uh, you're going to do it. Let's say, let's say it's kettlebell uh, sport you're training for, and you're doing 10, you know, 10 minute sets. And, uh, man, I'm really upset that I didn't get the reps I got the other day. I'm really upset that I, I was so much heavier than the other day. And so my answer is always training is training. Like, this is why we train. Like, this is not competition. You know, be, before a competition, first off, we, we have a deload week, right, to let your body rest. Right. And so you'll do some work, but you'll lighten up and you'll kind of program it into the, into the competition. And, uh, and we're, we're overloading you at times. We're doing certain things and we're doing extra accessory movements that you're not going to do, you know, in the competition, you know, yeah. Um, like she, she, you know, we have her doing these. Uh, they're they're called farmers holds. She just basic. It's like a farmers carry, but you just stand stand in one place and hold the kettlebells. And I actually got this. Thank you, Mike Salemi, is the one who told me about this uh, for for grip for kettlebell sport. Of course, I did farmers holds for years, but I never thought about sitting there for you know five or ten minutes holding you know two kettlebells. And so, um, I have her doing these, and she's like, man, it was so hard. Right after she and she weighs 135 pounds. Right after she did a, a, a 10 minute set of uh, 16, you know, kilogram kettlebells, like snatches. I'm like, yeah, it, it it would be hard. You know, it would be hard after that. You know, it's like it wasn't hard the other as hard the other day. I'm like, we well, did 12 kilograms the other day. And so, this is the thing I try and get people to understand is, you know, training is training. Like, you know, I, I know sometimes we 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 become PR junkies. Like, I, like I'm not immune to it. Like, I love a PR man. I'll post PRs. I. I you know, you, you know, as, as we get older, as we've been in, in certain sports longer, you get less PRs, right? Yeah. Because you're going to you're going to max out at a certain point. And so um, but when you get a PR, it's exciting. But I think sometimes we get hooked on the PRs in training and we're like, we all, like, OK, if I did 200 reps today, I got to do 201 to mo next time. Or it's not like that. You know, training is not like that. Like in any sport, it's just not. You know, some days, you know, with same bolt, probably the best sprinter ever. Some days he ran, you know, amazing. And I bet he had some days he was like, what the hell happened? I had nothing in the tank, right? So right. This, is, this is just part of the game, you know? Yeah, we get so obsessed with uh, trying to basically beat ourselves every, every time we go out and train. And, and um, it's just not 
doesn't make sense. It doesn't really help you. It, it starts to hinder you after a while. Uh, yeah, and then ask that question again. Okay. Uh, can you check your video connection or uh, something? We got your audio, but we lost your video. Oh, okay. Uh, let's see. Which is not altogether the worst possible thing because we're getting toward the end of the podcast anyway. As long as we got your voice. All right. Can you can you see me now or no? No. Hmm. Let me uh, hold on. Let me try something here. Hmm. I, I mean, I, I can see me in the corner, so I don't know. Yeah. Um, and you can see me. I can see you. Yeah. All right. Don't Not worry about. Sure. It. Don't worry about. It. You know. Uh, I mean, you know, the the more important thing is uh, being able to hear you. Um. So yeah. Um. I, I, that's, that's, uh, that's the thing that we all fall into, I guess, when it comes to, uh, our training, we take it seriously and, and we want to see that we're always progressing and everything, but progress can't just be measured in, uh, beating your reps or beating your, your last weight, your last PR, right? Yeah. I mean, you know, again, some days are good. Some days are bad, you know, and, uh, I don't know on the bad days, if you got the workout in, it's, it's a win. You know what I mean? If, yeah. if you were able to get a workout in on the days you're fatigued or you're tired or you're sore, right? I think it's a win. Yeah. You know? Yeah, and that, that was, you know, kind of my question. Uh, I guess that was part of my question about feeling, like, trash the next day. And, you know, did I go too far? Just because, um, you know, should I be going back and looking at what I'm doing training-wise and saying, okay, I need to, like, scale the certain things back here because, um, you know, every – fourth day or or every fifth day i'm starting to get super fatigued and right. and and uh i don't you know i'm feeling really sore or whatever so yeah, and that and that could be part of it you know um what i would say is it depends right yeah everything everything is a is it depends on the circumstances so let's say you added new movements that's probably what it is right so let's say you just you you started doing something different yeah or you're like, okay, I'm gonna go way heavier on mace ten to twos, and the next day you wake up and your triceps are like, what the hell? Yeah. You know, that's normal. You know, so um, like I, th- I don't know if you can relate to this. I, I hope you can. I hope it's not just me, but I'll, I'll do. Uh, I'm a I'm a big goblet squat guy. I like goblet squats and front, squ- uh, you know, front rack squats with kettlebells, things like that. But if I go like three weeks without doing them, because let's say I'm doing whatever other training. Right. And I just don't do them, which right. it doesn't really usually happen, but it has happened. And then I do them again. It's like I've never done them in my life. You know what I mean? Like yeah. I'll wake up the next day. My adductors on the inside of my thigh are screaming like, yeah. like what the hell I did. Right. And so like, OK, I'll give you a perfect example. Actually, I did lunges. Uh, 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 what is it? Kettlebell lunges yesterday for the first time in I don't even remember how long because I'm just not I like them. I just don't have them programmed in my in my training. And my glutes are freaking really sore. Yeah. You know, I only did a few sets, but I'm like, okay, so this is a new movement. You know, it's, it's, it's not brand new. It's not like I've never done it, but it's a movement I don't regularly do. So what I would say is definitely analyze your training, right? If you're doing new stuff, you know, it's not abnormal to have that kind of soreness. I mean, maybe scale it back a little until you make the adaptation, which usually doesn't take very long. Um, within a few workouts, you'll adapt. Um, but uh, if you're, if you're doing like a, like you're on a program and you're doing the same routine and you're, you're, hit, you're hitting that fourth or fifth day and you're getting trashed. Yeah. I think maybe scale what you're doing, pull out an exercise, cut a few sets, maybe, you know, things like that. Yeah. So, I, and I've done it, you know, there's, there's workouts where I, I, I plan on doing three or four sets of something and I'll scale it down to two and I'm like, okay, that's, that's what I'm doing today. You know, yeah. especially, you know, if I do, I, I try and do the kettlebell sport training first cause it's the most technical uh, that I yeah. do. Um, and that, um, and it's, it's brutal. And so the good thing about it is, um, it, you know, you get a great workout. The bad thing is when you're done with the sport, the kettlebell sport training, like I still have like goblet squats to do and push ups, and man, sometimes I'm trashed. You know? yeah. <laughs> sometimes I have to push to get through that last half of the workout, you know, cause really it's, it's a 10 minute set, you know, and then another maybe five two five minute sets or depending on how, how you program it. Right. And so you're, you're only like a half hour into your workout and uh you know so you just I, like i said it, it's individual you know um but i i think the nature of the beast is when you're into stuff like this is that we push too hard so yeah i mean analyze it scale it back it's okay to 
and by the way, it's okay. Like I know in bodybuilding, you know, like you read a bodybuilding magazine, they're like, do 13 sets of chest, you know, yeah. or maybe 18 sets of chest. <laughs> I did like, a lot of those workouts. Boy. <laughs> yeah. So, so I used to back in the day too. Yeah. And I'll tell you, it's funny. I, in, in college, uh, in, when I was in chiropractic school, I, uh, I had a buddy who was like a collegiate champ uh, powerlift. He's a monster. I used to call him Big Al. He, he's like he's like an inch taller than me and weighs about 280. He's just a, a beast and the strongest, one of the probably the strongest dude I've ever known personally. And um, he's like, you're doing too many sets, man. This yeah. is years ago. He's like, you're doing too many sets. He's like, cut, cut them in half, you know? And so I did, you know? And I started doing like eight or nine sets for chest. And man, I mean, I started getting stronger. You yeah. know what I mean? And I, and I didn't lose size. You know, I, I probably was about the same size and same definition, but I was actually getting stronger. Strength went making, up. Yeah. Yeah. And so, when, when your strength goes up, you're, you're, you, you start, you're building more muscle while you're at it. Yeah. You, you mean, you build more muscle and then, you know, again, it, it, it's, I, I'm always looking at this. This is why I'm big on technique as well. Is that injury component? Like I want to avoid injury and, and I do, I do it to myself plenty. Like where I tweak little things because sometimes I overdo it, but um, I want to avoid injury as much as possible because my, my biggest thing is I got to work out tomorrow. Yeah. Like, so I want to make sure my training tomorrow is good. Right. Right. So if, if, if I'm supposed to do three sets of mace 10 to twos and I'm going heavy and I do two sets and I'm like, man, I'm, I'm, I'm feeling it. Like, I feel like that's it. I stop, you know, and then tomorrow I get a good, good training. If I, if I do that, I, I've learned, I guess, over time, if I do that one extra set sometimes or those extra reps, you know, it's the straw that broke the camel's back. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You know, I'll either, I'll either get an injury or I'll be so trashed that my workout the next day is, is you know, practically worthless. So, um, yeah, I mean, that, man, that 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 is the lesson. Like, and that, you can only learn that by experience, but that's the lesson. I was just going to say. Being able to, you know, like scale yourself, you know what I mean? Being able to say, okay, when's it like knowing your body, knowing when's enough. Because, um, you know, as an athlete, you want to push, right? right? Or even just as an av avid, like, exercise enthusiasts you know you want to push you want to you want gains you want you want to see results yeah and that's why we do it right right i mean look if i did the mace and i was i wasn't getting any results like my triceps are bigger than they've been in years like since i was doing bodybuilding yeah and um you know and, and not that i'm going for that you know not that they're gigantic but i mean like they're they're more developed you know and so um if i wasn't seeing results from the things that i'm doing then I, I just wouldn't do them, right? I mean, like, think about it. Anything you do, if you don't see if you don't see an end result for it, why do it? So yeah. Um, so we push, you know. So we tend to push and push harder, you know. Like, uh, I apologize if I keep including you, but I think you're I think you're the same mindset. People like us, we enjoy working out. Like I enjoy fitness. Yes. And people are like, oh man, you you work out a lot. Like you work out a lot, but they look at it as a chore. Right. And what I tell them is they have to find something they like because there's going to be something they like to do, whether it's tennis, whether it's running, which I listen, I tell people they like do you run and I, and I, I sprint. I'll do sprints. But but they ask me if I run and I say, look, I only run if I'm being chased by a T-Rex. <laughs> yeah, and right. they're like, there, <laughs> there are no T-Rexes. I'm like, exactly. Yeah. I don't run. And so so that's the thing. You know, I'm just not a runner, you know, but I'm OK with people running. Yeah. You know what I mean, like, yeah. I, like I, I encourage you, if that's your thing, then do your thing. And so. um yeah, so you got to find a thing you love to do, and we love to do it. Right. So we're gonna push. We're gonna we're gonna want to do it all the time, even when we're sore, even when we're tired, even when we're fatigued, and then learning. You know, so this is great for athletes or anybody that's really you know driven, is learning when not to push. You know, yeah. still being able to push so you make the development and you can still be competitive in whatever you're in, but you know, not trashing yourself because again you lose games that way right i mean yeah. that you're you're not going to make the progress you're not optimized it's it's overtraining like right. i i've been there overtraining syndrome i've been there before yeah and, and so and, and you know this is where having you know everybody should have a coach every you know especially no matter how good you are you you have that in your mind where you want to push the envelope but maybe you need a good coach to say hey not today you know let, yeah. let's just chill today from what i'm seeing You've been working hard, and today is the kind of day where we're going to back off a little bit. And you listen to your coach, and then because of that, you, you know, you need that outside perspective sometimes. You need yeah. somebody looking at you. You don't always know what's best for you under these conditions. Absolutely. And, and, Absolutely. Uh, you also mentioned 
uh, about following something that's going to get you into the game. What's your passion or whatever? And this is what I'm finding with, with Steel Mace is um, that there's people that would never walk into a gym, but they'll pick up a mace and they'll flow or they'll do 10 and twos, you know, out on the beach or by a waterfall. Um, and they don't, maybe they don't even think of it as working out. They're thinking of it as more like, a, a, you know, it's, there's a skill that they're learning or it's just mindful movement type of meditation, whatever it is. But at the end of the day, they're moving their bodies. Uh, they're pushing a little weight around or pulling it around, depending on which direction it's going. Um, okay. And, hey, you know, maybe after an hour, they burned, you know, 250 calories or whatever, and they activated muscle groups that otherwise would be almost dormant. So um, that's what, what I'm noticing. The, the mace it bridges that gap and makes that yeah. happen for a lot of people. Absolutely. Yeah. I, so, I, I agree. You know, and, and one thing I'll throw in there just as, as a little uh, fun fact is I did a post on this a while back, but. Uh, there was a research study where they, they were looking at the uh, amount of calories uh, burned during a uh, kettlebell snatch. Oh, okay. And so w what they found is that it was the equivalent of – so they did like a 10-minute uh, – well, actually, it was a 20-minute set, like interval style. Like, right. you know, you, set, you do a minute, set it down, a minute, with a, you know, a certain number of reps. And they found that the amount of calories that you burned was equivalent to if you had run – uh, a six minute mile for 20 minutes. Nice. And so you know, I like to I hear that. People, yeah. And so it, it's amazing. Right. And, and the thing is you actually, in my, okay, again, I'm gonna say my opinion, but also based on physiology, I think it's better. Uh, okay. Not unless you're if you love running, do it, but it's better for your body overall, at least working because for, for the kettlebell snatches, because you're working practically every muscle in your body right like at least a couple of hundred muscles i try i was trying to add them up one time and it was becoming burdensome but <laughs> i was well well over 100 by the time i got to this I, that's just a swing i yeah. haven't even finished uh, getting all the muscles for just the swing part and so you know when you add all the muscles for the upper body and stabilizers i mean you're working hundreds of muscles with the kettlebell snatch and yeah so i mean so people ask me like do you do, you do cardio and i and i say no because that i used to you know i used to get on the stepper yeah. for 45 minutes and even I used to jog on the treadmill. I used to do all these different, you know, types of uh, cardiovascular movements. And when they, I say no and yes, I say no, I don't do your traditional cardio. But yes, I get really good cardio. Yeah. Because I'll do ten minute sets of kettlebell, you know. And and what I do now is I, you know, I, I don't set the kettlebell down. So I'm training for this uh, for sport where you only switch hands once, which is extremely brutal. Um, sometimes I'll switch multiple times. Sometimes I won't. But you, you don't set the kettlebell down for ten minutes, and, and if you don't get a cardio workout out of that, oh yeah, you're not doing you're not doing it right. <laughs> yeah, you're just whole, so, even if you're. So, but 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 to your point, it's it's like people will, will do things. They're like they they won't run, by some people. Some people love it, but some people won't run, like myself. And like, what do they do? What do those people do for cardio? Right. Pick up a kettlebell. I guarantee. Do swings. Do three hundred swings. Right. You know, even if you do it in sets of fifty or whatever, or whatever, or sets of twenty-five, whatever you decide to do. Right. You will get cardio. Yeah. You know. Yeah, you have you know? to. And, and, and Go ahead. I was gonna say, and the steel mace too. You know, when I did, when I did some of the heavy stuff that I was doing, my muscles were starting to shake and things like that. Yeah. Right. But I'm breathing heavy. Like yes. It, <laughs> I'm telling you that that is, that move those movements are tough. Yeah, you know, you're a 360, a 10 to two, which I think are the key core movements. You know, there's plenty of other cool movements as well, but those are the key core movements. Man, if you do enough reps on those, you you should be breathing heavy. Yeah, you know? your, your so, muscles are demanding oxygen. So what's going to happen? You're going to breathe harder, and your heart rate's going absolutely. up. It has to happen. It's there's absolutely. no other way it works. That's really cool. So, doctor, last question for you before we go. Um, as far as steel mace, uh, is concerned, where do you envision, um, the, the steel mace modality going where, like, where do you say it's going to be in a couple years from now? You know, I, it's always hard to, to predict things like that, but you know, the, the trend is that it, it's really growing pretty exponentially at this point, you yeah. know, um, you know, you've got people like Rick Brown. Uh, you've got people, you know, Mr. Mace Man, and you've got people like Leo Savage doing some of the flow, you know, doing the flow stuff. Right. I know there's a bunch of other people out there, so I'm not like trying to not mention names. There's plenty of other people, you know, you're, you're doing, you know, you're doing this with the Steel Mace Nation stuff. And um, I, I think we're going to see in the next three to five years, 
that at least, and my hope is that happens this happens as well that the mates will be as popular today as the kettlebell or sorry be as popular in five years as the kettlebell is today yeah because if you look at the kettlebell five years ago it wasn't where it is today no. you know what i mean and so and if you go back you know 10 years it's even even less you know it's, it's yeah. you know, barely but when i first started buying kettlebells you couldn't find them like i literally searched everywhere pick and would scrounge one here and there at these little fitness places yeah and so and you're talking about about 12 years ago i started to collect them and so um yeah they, they were hard to find at that point in time now you can walk into any sporting goods store and there's kettlebells right? yeah you, definitely. you know you look you look online there's kettlebell stuff everywhere and yep. so so my thought is that the, the steel mace you know, clubs, mace, things like that in about five years will will we'll hopefully uh, have the same notoriety as kettlebells do today. And kettlebells will hopefully be further along. I think you know, kettlebells, kettlebells still has the mainstream. Kettlebells still has some more climbing to do, I think. I think um, I think so as well. Yeah, yeah, I really do. You know, I think I think uh, the, the kettlebell sport itself is becoming more popular. Yeah. Right. Um, you know, and then IKLF has some different rules to, to their um, their kettlebell sport uh, competitions. So I think it's good to have the variety, you know, to draw different people in. There's mace competitions now. I'm not sure if you're familiar with these, but uh, yeah, they I guess the... they've had them for a little bit. But they've, they kind of, it's, it, to me, it's been almost underground because I didn't I didn't know about it until pretty recently. It still has you that know? underground feel to it. Um, yeah. But there's the vintage strength games in uh, yeah. Virginia going down August 17th. Absolutely. That's, that's going to be big. Yeah. And uh, a guy I train with um, is going to be going down there and actually competing in it. I, I'm thinking I'm going to awesome. go with him just to, uh, you know, I'm going to drive so he could rest and, uh, you know, I'll walk around, do like, you know, get pictures and stuff like that just go support but i definitely want to go down there for yeah. that since it's yeah. uh not too far of a drive from here so that'd be awesome yeah definitely i think uh, i i agree with you doctor i think uh there's going to be another blast coming out pretty soon um more people are going to get into both of those modalities and another one would be animal flow too because they're all kind of like synced up with each other uh, or ground-based mo movements, if you want to go by more yeah. generic. Well, term, I, and and the, th the thing that people don't realize, and this is like, I get this from my students all the time, when I because I always advertise my weightlifting class. Say, hey, you know, because it starts about a, two weeks into the semester. And, uh, you know, I get a lot of people asking me, especially women, they're like, well, do I have to lift heavy weight? And it, that's not what it's about, right? First right. of all, heavy weight for one person is completely different for another, right? Yeah. And so, um, so, um, the thing about the, 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 the functional training, the body weight, the, there's always scales for these things. You yeah. know what I mean? There's right. for, for, for maces, there's lighter weights, right? That you could start off with for, you know, kettlebells, there's different weights for body weight stuff. You can scale it, right? We can do pushups on the knees. We can do, you know, plank holds, you know, there's, there's different things you can do. And so I, I don't think people realize when they see like, a, like guys like slinging around a mace or flinging a kettlebell, like there's lots of women that are doing this as well now. Yes. And, and let me tell you, some of them are really badass. Yeah. And definitely. so this is, this is not a sport or, or even a, a fitness, whatever you want to call it, style or training or whatever modality uh, for, for men. This is, this is, this, this translates, you know, to, to, you know, men, women, young, old, I've seen, I've seen, you know, yeah. people, you know, uh, that are, that are in their sixties and seventies swinging a mace. Yep. I've seen, you know, same thing for kettlebells. I've seen, you know, kids competing in kettlebell sport. I'm talking like, you know, you know, seven, eight year old, you know, yeah. kids, Pretty you young. know, maybe, maybe even a little younger. I'm never good with gauging ages, but, um, you know, uh, there's a guy that makes, uh, you know, kettlebells for children, you know, they're two, four and six kilogram kettlebells sport, sport style. And so, you know, again, this is this is for everybody, in my opinion. And I think once people get that, you know what I mean. Once yeah. they, once people start to see, hey, this is right. not just for some like weirdo on you know Instagram that swings around a heavy mace like 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 he's a barbarian, right? I mean, Viking. you know, like we we like to think that we are, but but the reality is is that this is a great fitness modality, and the people that are not doing it, man, they're missing out on it because Hell like yeah. like you like you talked about earlier in the podcast, just the development of the triceps alone. So like, okay, so let's let's just say this before we get, before we go. Uh, you want to talk about major muscle groups, okay? Because people ask me all the time, like, what, what does that even do? You know, it looks cool, but what does it do? Let me tell you the things that you're going to get out of it, okay? Besides cardiovascular, if you do enough reps, so you will get cardiovascular, the key groups you're going to hit, definitely triceps, definitely shoulder. And for shoulder, it's going to be mobility and stability, strengthening stabilizers and strengthening the overall shoulder, joint, and muscles themselves, um, it's going to be core, 
Because I'm telling you, when you do circular movements, you have to have core stability. So it's going to strengthen the heck out of your core. In fact, usually when I'm doing heavy sets, what gives out, and I have a pretty strong core, but what gives out before my arms do is my core. Because just, just yeah. that, that circular movement, man, mm -hmm. it's just constantly pulling on you. Uh, uh, strengthening of the tendons. And uh, let's see, did I miss anything? So we've got core, triceps, shoulders. Oh, and then f f I, one of the biggest things of all, I almost forgot. Grip strength. Yeah. It literally will right. work like every muscle in your forearm. Yeah. If there's a muscle in your forearm that doesn't work, I'm not aware of it. I haven't tested it, studied it, you know, done it, done an EMG on it. But my point is when you do this, when you do uh, any kind of mace training, I mean, literally any of the mace movements, it works grip. Every yeah. single mace movement you do, it works grip. And so, um, and people say, well, why do I want a strong grip? But it, it works your forearms and, and, and that strength transfers to so many other things i mean let's say you're doing a deadlift i was just gonna what say gives, yeah what gives out on a lot of people grip grip that's it yeah yeah that's so, one thing i noticed is uh lately my my friggin deadlift feels so good and uh my personal trainer is like yeah it's because you've been doing the mace your your grip is doing so much better yeah. and um um before i have to turn my hand over you know to do the 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 olympic style grip so i can hold it better i'm going up higher in weight before i have to turn it over so that that right. goes to show it's and the only thing that's changed is i had it in mace yeah it makes a difference well you know and, and for people that compete you know in in power lifting you can't use wraps like i i've never been listen, right I, if you use wraps i don't judge it i've never been a fan of wraps because i feel like you have to develop the grip yeah so just because your hips are strong enough to lift the weight your grip has to be strong enough otherwise you're not pulling it off the floor for competition right and so when i train i train even if i'm not competing and i have competed with powerlifting, but even if i'm not I, I train as if i am and so you know again i want my grip to be equivalent i want to be able to handle with my grip as much as my hips can handle you know to to, to drive that weight up yeah so um you know, again, doing this type of accessory work, um, you know, is, I think it's key. It's key for strength athletes in general. But you can use it as just a, a component, a modality of your fitness training in general. So, again, I, I actually keep saying competitors, but you don't have to be, you don't have to compete to do this stuff. I mean, you don't, right. have, to, you don't have to have a goal to compete to do this stuff. This stuff is great for your overall fitness. And so, I mean, listen, you want to talk about functional fitness. What's grip strength important for? I mean, listen, opening a jar when you're 70 years old. I don't know. You know, you know what I'm saying? Right. It's like, you know, I go, I go over, you know, family and they can't open a jar. Who do they hand it to? Here you go. Tony. The guy with the grip. Right? <laughs> so, Dr. Grip. Yeah. I'm like, this is the maze training in, 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 in action. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm kidding. But the, but the thing is, it really is functional. You know, yeah. it's functional for you know, overall living, the things you do in your daily yes. life. And uh, by the way, the core strengthening, you know, people that have back issues, man, this is a great way. Those cir that cir those circular movements, Rick Brown, I love me saying this, those circular movements, man, that is great for, in my opinion, strengthening the core to the point where you're, you actually not only protect your back, but I think re rehabilitation. I think it should be a component of rehabilitation for people. Yes. So, that you would know, be great. I completely yeah. rehab my elbows. I give the mace 100% credit for the rehabilitation of my elbows. I mean, that's that's just a fact. And uh, my back is I've, I've had back issues. I'll tell you, I'll tell you, I'll tell you one an interesting story, short story. I, I I had a very bad back for for a few years, and it was from uh, I, I started doing some Shaolin stuff. They do a lot of jumping, so martial arts, and uh, I did that for about three and a half years. Um, I did that and I was doing a lot of lifting and uh, my back was not doing well. And so, and again, this is before I got more into the functional fitness stuff. And uh, so I decided to go back to basics, study more biomechanics, find out what the hell I'm doing wrong with my lifting and what can I do to make it stronger so that I can handle these other types of activities that I want to be, you know, participate in. Right. And I will tell you this, I rehabbed my lower back with kettlebell swings and deadlifts. These are the two things. I learned how to do them proper, which mm -hmm. I never did before. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I, re, I rehabilitated my, my low back with it. My low back today is very, very strong because of it. Yeah. And so now think about this. Most people, when they do deadlifts or kettlebells, one of the one of the problems is they injure their back and it, and it has everything to do with technique. Yes. So people are always worried. Well, I did when I did this and I had people tell me this when I did kettlebell swings, it hurt my back. When I did deadlifts, it hurt my back. I'm like, OK, 
let me show you what to do. Okay, because I rehabilitated my back with these movements. Let's scale the weight down. Let's get the technique and build a rock solid core and a rock solid lower back, which again, the, the muscle, some of the muscle in the lower back are part of the core. You know, it's the posterior core. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, yeah, mace training is great for that as well. And so um, great component for rehabilitation, in my opinion. Absolutely. I, you know, Doc, that's um, th that should be the answer to everything right there. I mean, either to just stay healthy or get back to healthy again. You know, everybody's got lives. They work. They got jobs and, and kids and vacations and stuff. Not everybody wants to compete, and you don't have to, but think about these exercises as a viable way to take care of yourself and stay functional and healthy into your old age and not be, you know, sitting on a, in a rocking chair and you can barely get up, but actually out there playing with your grandkids or going fishing or whatever you want to do. I, I think it's fantastic. And, Doctor, you got, uh, you know, tons of information. Obviously, we heard – a plethora of it in, in this episode um but your instagram is good and you have a youtube channel right yep so the youtube is uh is weightlifting doc uh two two separate words weightlifting and then uh space doc um and then my instagram is weightlifting doc all one word right um yeah okay so i on on uh, facebook they wouldn't let me change it i i you know i'm a, i have my master's in nutrition so i i do a lot of nutritional stuff and um so I started off as nutrition doc. So I made a page on, uh, on Facebook years ago, like probably seven, eight years ago, um, maybe about seven years ago, um, called nutrition doc. I've tried to change the weightlifting doc. They're like, mm, we're not going to let you do it. So yeah. it's called nutrition doc. It's the okay. page on Instagram. I mean, on, on, uh, Facebook. on Facebook. And, uh, so yeah. And I usually, to be completely honest, I, I mainly just, whatever I do, if you're on Instagram, you're good. Whatever I do on Instagram, I post to nutrition doc. I have a group on uh, Facebook called weightlifting doc. I'll post, but, it's almost always the stuff that I put on Instagram. I post to those two okay. just so that uh, there's a few people that, you know, just they're not, they're not keen on Instagram. So yeah, you know, I'll, I'll put it on a couple of different resources for them. And, and as far as uh, people actually hooking up with you in person to, to work with you, uh, what area are you working in? So I'm, uh, I'm in Phoenix and, uh, so I, I have a class at the, at uh, Paradise Valley college, uh, which is, um, which is in Phoenix, 32nd Street, uh, 30, yeah, 32nd Street in Union Hills uh, in Phoenix. Um, and I live up in Cave Creek, which is probably about 15 minutes from there. Okay. And so, um, so yeah, anywhere in the metro Phoenix area, you know, yeah. uh, you just touch base with me through Instagram, DM me through Instagram or something. Right. And, uh, yeah, yeah, we can, we can sync up. All right, cool. Uh, doctor, I appreciate the podcast. We, we lost the video on you, but your, your voice stayed strong throughout <laughs> right to uh, the so end. I, yeah. I, I, I can, I can see me. I can see you. I don't know what the heck happened. To yeah. Me I, don't I don't know. I don't know. This I think, technology. I think the video just got tired of looking at my face and it was like, ah, right, we had enough. <laughs> <laughs> that could be true, but you know, I think it's just, um, you know, glitches in technology. So, I see you got a collection in the background there. This is it. these these superheroes. What do we got? Back well, there? I, I do this in a professional podcast studio. It's called a shared okay. universe, and um, okay. they they have like three suites up here, and this is like their bigger suite. But each one is decorated with all this stuff here, and nice. this this dude right here is from Star Wars. Um, it's called a, a a Porky or something. I don't know what it's called. <laughs> I keep asking. I can't remember the name. I don't remember seeing, but um, porgy. A, a Porky. A porgy. Pork. pork. It's a pork. pork. Okay. And then over here is like bobbleheads and and uh, there's the the hand from uh, Nightmare on Elm Street. The guy, Freddy, the guy with the claw. Freddy Krueger. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And it's and it's signed. You know. So there's a lot of cool stuff in in this nice. place. So and uh, yeah, yeah, the reason I, the reason I ask, I I, I have a, a collection myself. I'm I'm a superhero nerd. So oh, okay. Anything superhero related, uh, man, I'm, I'm all geeked out on it. Dude, you <laughs> you would lose your mind if you came in here. You like it, you would just be walking around. It's like a, a museum in here. There's superheroes, Batman stuff all over the place. Oh, nice. I mean, there's everything in here. It's it's pretty cool. So yeah, maybe if you ever get over to the Jersey Shore area and you want to do a podcast in person, you could check the place out. You know, hit me awesome. up. So you're, you're, are you you're in New Jersey? You yeah, yeah. New Jersey? Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I grew up in Queens, uh, New York. Oh, okay. So, so not, not far from you guys. All right. Yeah, yeah and, and yeah. I, I like California. I, I think one day I'd, I'd like to move out there maybe. But, you know, right now we got to 
me and my wife have to finish up our careers and see where that brings us to. But yeah, so um, yeah, thanks for uh, you know coming on the podcast and and I look forward to seeing uh, more stuff come out on Instagram and 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 I hope to talk Absolutely. to you again soon. Yeah, sounds good, man. I appreciate you having me on. Thanks so much. It's it's an honor to talk to you. Yeah, you got it. Thank you. It's an honor too. Thank you.